Hey everyone and welcome back to Bye Holly G. Welcome to today's video. So I have basically just finished my masters in cancer biology and so I was like this is the perfect time to just sit down and have a chat with you guys about cancer. This video is for anyone regardless of whether you've studied biology before in the past. You are going to finish watching this video and you're going to feel like a cancer expert you know. So yeah I really hope you enjoy it. As usual give it a thumbs up if you do. Comment down below and subscribe to join the Bye Holly G community and yeah we're going to dive straight into it because it is a big big question like what is cancer it is also going to be centered and structured around two key papers that have been published called the hallmarks of cancer the first was published in 2000 and then the second so the next generation paper came out in 2011 and they were both published by hanahan and weinberg so these two papers basically aimed to like simplify and unify the key characteristics and properties of human cancers and they were two seminal groundbreaking papers and if you take anything away from this video all cancers show abnormal and uncontrolled proliferation so they just divide without normal constraints okay and so that is why we end up with tumor masses that are collections of so many cancer cells and secondly they have the ability to spread around the body in a process that we call metastasis so those are two key properties to keep in mind they are hallmarks of cancer but they are like the really key properties that you should know about cancer you know they divide out of control and they can spread around the body and the final thing that i should emphasize here and i spoke about this a bit more in my first video about cancer on my channel cancer is a collection of diseases but even more importantly cancer is so so heterogeneous and so diverse like no two breast tumors are the same and if i zoomed in on a single breast tumor in a single patient none of those cancer cells or those tumor cells that form that mass would be identical even though we do have these hallmarks and these unifying features every cancer is unique every cancer cell is different and so if you imagine that which is actually quite difficult to comprehend that is what makes it so difficult to treat cancer. So the next thing I just want to do is answer three kind of commonly asked questions about cancer. So the first question is basically, can you inherit cancer? And the answer is yes, you can inherit cancer. However, it is incredibly rare. The majority of cancers, and I'm talking about 90 to 95%, are what we call sporadic or not inherited. So that is definitely the majority. And then that leaves the five to 10% which are inherited. So you can basically inherit a particular mutation or a trait that puts you at an increased risk of cancer. And something you have probably heard about is HBOC, heritable breast and ovarian cancer. That was like popularized by the Angelina Jolie case. So what that means is that you can inherit traits that put you at a higher risk of developing breast and or ovarian cancer. Question number two is where can cancer arise in the body? And the answer is pretty much everywhere. It can arise from any tissue in the body. But again, the majority are derived from epithelial tissues. Those are what we call your carcinomas. So for example, like your skin cancers, your colorectal cancers, epithelial tissues are the tissues that cover internal and external bodily surfaces and secondly we obviously have blood cancers so we have leukemias and we have lymphomas and then the rarest types of cancers are your sarcomas so they come from connective tissue and connective tissue is like bone muscle and fat and the reason why they are quite rare is because those tissues so like connective tissues they don't divide as often or as much as epithelial tissues which show quite a high turnover for example like the tissue lining your intestines so your gut that is epithelial tissue and that has to constantly regenerate itself and the third question we're just going to answer is basically how does cancer come about how does it arise in the body and this is yes a very complex question because there are lots of factors that influence the development of cancer which is what we can call carcinogenesis or tumorigenesis but to simplify this question cancer basically takes a very very long time to develop years decades to arise and so that is why age is a risk factor for cancer individual cells have to acquire numerous characteristics that result in them becoming fully cancerous it takes therefore time for these characteristics to accumulate because cancer is what we call an evolutionary disease cancer evolves so when a cell acquires a characteristic that gives it an advantage over its surrounding cells that characteristic will be passed on to its 
daughter cells and its frequency will increase in the population of those cells and that is an iterative process so lots of these different characteristics these hallmarks as we're going to talk about have to be acquired for cancer to fully develop and these traits are normally acquired through genetic changes what we call mutations so a mutation is basically a change in the dna sequence and that change in the dna sequence gives rise to a novel characteristic or a novel trait and then as i said that is acted on by natural selection if it's beneficial then it's going to be maintained passed on to other cells and then spread in the population a study that was published in 2017 i'm pretty sure was somewhat controversial but that study argued that you need between one and ten mutations what we call driver mutations for full-blown cancer but that does depend on the type of cancer so for example like breast tumors were estimated to need on average four to five mutations colorectal cancer anywhere between like eight and 13 on the other hand you've got like testicular cancer which can arise from just one mutation so it does vary however the general consensus is that it takes a long time for cancer to develop because we need to acquire these mutations that give rise to novel traits and these traits are the hallmarks of cancer and that is what we're now going to focus on so i'm going to talk you through the hallmarks of cancer so i'm going to show you a diagram that was taken from the 2011 papers and we're going to basically talk through these hallmarks all these key properties of cancer cells one by one i'm going to keep it really simple as i said so the first hallmark of cancer then hallmark number one is basically sustained or sustaining proliferative signaling so essentially a normal cell will be told when it should divide factors that we call growth factors will act on a cell and tell a cell that it needs to divide but what happens in cancer is that tumor cells lose that reliance on growth factors they can basically divide without needing to be told to divide so for example they might express a lot of a particular growth factor they might over express growth factors they might synthesize their own growth factors to set up a positive feedback loop so they don't rely on external growth factors provided by other cells so that's hallmark number one and the second hallmark goes hand in hand with that because the second hallmark is basically evading growth suppressors again normal cells will be told when to stop dividing it's like when someone presses a brake in a car you know you slow down and you come to a stop similarly a cell will receive signals again that tell it to stop dividing and that can either be temporary or it can be permanent however again tumor cells ignore those signals so they won't stop when they need to stop dividing they will just keep dividing and these two hallmarks then can be used to define what we call oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes in cancer so as i said before mutations are changes in the dna sequence that give rise to potentially new properties that might be beneficial to a cancer cell and an oncogene is essentially a mutated proto-oncogene so in a normal cell we have what are called proto-oncogenes and they are the signals that tell a cell to divide so if you apply this to the growth factors for example a growth factor gene is a proto-oncogene when that is mutated it becomes an oncogene and that might mean that it is overexpressed or it's constantly switched on that oncogene is going to drive tumor growth so a proto-oncogene is normal and oncogene is abnormal they are what we refer to as the go signals an analogy that is often used is that a proto-oncogene is like the accelerator pedal in a car what happens in cancer is that pedal gets stuck to the ground so you can't like take your foot off the accelerator pedal anymore it's just constantly down and so the car is constantly driving forwards likewise cancer cells are constantly dividing on the flip side we have tumor suppressor genes so in a normal cell a tumor suppressor gene will suppress tumor growth and in this case the analogy is that the tumor suppressor gene is like the brake pedal in a car you can choose when you want to slow down in a car but a cancer cell again it loses that ability and so now you can't press the brake pedal down you can't stop moving forwards in a car and that's akin to a cancer cell not being able to stop dividing when it needs to stop dividing so when a tumor suppressor gene gets mutated it basically gets turned off or it gets silenced and logically tumor suppressor genes are therefore referred to as the stop signals you have the go signals and the stop signals and both of them are mutated in cancer on the one hand the go signals are constantly on and on the other hand the stop signals don't function anymore they are silenced and so together this gives rise to abnormal and out of control 
proliferation or cell division in cancer cells. So moving away from the first two hallmarks then, hallmark number three is basically avoiding immune destruction. So this is one of the newer hallmarks. This wasn't part of the original paper in 2000. This has been an added hallmark. The immune system in our body is designed to prevent infection and it normally doesn't attack self cells because it recognizes self cells and it knows that it shouldn't attack them. And that is what we call tolerance, okay? The immune system tolerizes our normal self body cells. It would seem logical, first of all, to suggest that, you know, these tumor cells are not going to be removed by the immune system because they are derived from normal body cells. However, as I said, tumors acquire all of these mutations and these novel properties. And because they acquire so many changes, they become so different from a normal self cell. And so it's no longer recognized as a normal self cell. It's actually recognized as something that is foreign. And so the immune system will destroy tumor cells and get rid of them, which is great. You know, our immune system can remove tumor cells. Our bodies are naturally protecting us from cancer. The immune system is doing that all the time. So the immune system is not not only getting rid of like COVID and other pathogens, but it's also getting rid of cells that are potentially cancerous, which is a win-win for us. But cancer cells, again, they avoid this immune destruction. What happens is they evolve and they acquire characteristics, which mean they're no longer recognized by the immune system and even worse, they're not removed by the immune system anymore. So that is what we mean by evading the immune response. They can survive even though the immune system should recognize them as foreign and remove them. So we're on to hallmark number four then. This is basically enabling replicative immortality. Again, we're gonna start by talking about normal cells. So normally, a cell has a finite lifespan. It's what we call the Hayflick limit. It's normally 60 to 70 cell divisions. Cancer cells acquire the ability to basically become immortal. They can divide and keep dividing with an infinite lifespan. We can say that they divide without any intrinsic limit. They can just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. And if you know anything about stem cells or if you've watched the video on my channel about stem cells, you might be like, Holly, but stem cells can divide without a limit. And you're right, like stem cells are very powerful cells in the body. They can divide again without this limit. They are not limited by the Hayflick limit. And so what happens is tumor cells take on that stem cell like property. They take on the ability to divide without this limit. Hallmark number five is again, another new hallmark. It was only introduced in the second paper. So in 2011, this is basically what we call tumor promoting inflammation. So inflammation is now recognized to play a role in cancer. Inflammation can cause cancer cancer. For example, Helicobacter pylori infection, that's a particular type of bacterial infection, can cause what we call gastritis. So anything with itis on the end in biology, fun fact, means inflammation. So gastritis means inflammation of the stomach. Chronic inflammation of the stomach, so ongoing and long-term inflammation, can result in gastric cancer. We now recognize that tobacco smoke can cause inflammation and can contribute to cancer. And likewise, obesity is a form of inflammation in the body. It is chronically inflamed. Obesity is a risk factor again for cancer. Keeping that in mind, it also makes sense then as to why aspirin, which is an anti-inflammatory medication, is being trialed for use in cancer. So aspirin is an over-the-counter drug. It's what we call a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. There are trials ongoing. I don't know how successful it has been at the moment, but aspirin is being trialed in cancer treatment. And cancer itself is what we would refer to as a non-healing wound. It's basically like an open wound that never heals. It's chronically inflamed. There is all this inflammation in cancer and it's very, very complex, but it is a very new and exciting field within cancer biology. Hallmark number six then is basically activating invasion and metastasis. So metastasis, as I said at the start, is the spread of cancer cells around the body. And we have what we call benign tumors, which are non-cancerous tumors. A benign tumor doesn't have the ability to spread around the body. And in that sense, a benign tumor is not cancerous. Like for example, a mole. A mole on your body is a benign tumor. It's not cancer, but it is a tumor still. On the other hand, we have what we call malignant tumors. And a malignant tumor is cancer because it has the potential to spread around the body. It might not have spread yet, but it has the potential to spread around the body by metastasis and form a secondary tumor somewhere else in the body. And the thing with metastasis, it's so, so important that we understand metastasis, like how it works, what causes metastasis, you know, what properties a cancer cell needs to acquire to be able to spread around the body, because 90% of cancer deaths, i.e. the majority, 
are caused by secondary tumors or metastases around the body. Only 10% are actually caused by the primary tumor itself. And basically what happens is the cells of a primary tumor firstly have to locally invade the surrounding tissue. So a benign tumor will normally just sit very happily, it won't show any invasive properties. And so in that respect, we can cure benign tumors because we can simply cut them out very easily with surgery in most cases. However, with a malignant tumor, because it shows this local invasion and because it starts to spread, it's then more difficult to cut it out, you know, and get all of the cancer cells because they are infiltrating the surrounding tissues. Once they've started to invade locally, they can then spread around the body. So they can spread on a larger scale and spread in a systemic manner. And cancer cells normally take one of three routes around the body. So they can spread or they can metastasize in the blood. They can spread in lymphatic vessels to the lymph system. And thirdly, the least common route is through body cavities. It's what we call transcelomic spread. So for example, seen in gastric cancer and ovarian cancer. Number seven is the induction of angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the development of new blood vessels. Angiogenesis, like with all of these properties, it's a normal process that happens in the body, but with cancer, it's just abnormal and dysregulated. The reason why angiogenesis is so important for a tumor, like this tumor has to develop its own blood supply, is in order for it to grow beyond one to two millimeters cubed in size, it needs its own blood supply because otherwise the cells won't be able to survive. They are going to be without oxygen and without essential nutrients that are delivered through the blood. Oxygen, glucose, other essential nutrients, it will allow the removal of waste products. So for example, like carbon dioxide from respiration. And at the same time, it also provides a highway for those cancer cells to escape and to spread by metastasis. The characteristic feature of this blood supply, this tumor blood supply, is that as I said, it's abnormal. It's very chaotic and erratic, and it's also very leaky. Hallmark number eight is genome instability and mutation. This is a very interesting hallmark because if you think about it, and as I've been talking to you about, cancer cells, in order to become cancer cells, they need to acquire all of these mutations and all of these new phenotypes or these new traits. If a cancer cell becomes genetically unstable, which basically means it is more likely to accumulate mutations, then that means that a cancer cell is more likely to develop beneficial mutations that give it these novel traits or these novel hallmarks. So for example, it might mean that it is more likely to develop and acquire a mutation. That means it can stimulate angiogenesis and develop its own blood supply. Normally cells have so many checkpoints and control mechanisms that mean when there is damage to DNA, that damage is repaired. Or when something goes wrong in a cell, then that cell is either removed or, you know, there are checkpoints to fix whatever has gone wrong. But in a cancer cell, it just ignores those checkpoints. It gets rid of those checkpoints and it gets rid of those DNA repair mechanisms. So that is genetic instability. It means that a cancer cell is more mutable. And as you can imagine, if that occurs quite early on in tumorigenesis or tumor development, then it will just accelerate the whole process. Hormone number nine is then resisting cell death. So in a normal multicellular organism, so as humans, we are multicellular, we are made of lots and lots of cells. It is beneficial to sometimes remove cells that are functioning in an abnormal way, or they've just reached the end of their lifespan, for example. It is very good for us to be able to remove these cells in a process that we call programmed cell death. So one form of programmed cell death is apoptosis. It's basically like a cell committing suicide, it is programmed to undergo cell death. And that's a good thing. But with cancer cells, what they do again is they don't die when they should die. They avoid the signals that tell them that they should undergo apoptosis and they will survive, which is again problematic because if these cancer cells are becoming abnormal, they are showing damage to their DNA, then it would make sense to normally remove them, but they don't get removed. So they stay there. Finally, then the last hallmark that we're going to talk about. So hallmark number 10, there are 10 recognized hallmarks. This is basically called or referred to as deregulating cellular energetics. This is a new recognized hallmark of cancer. Again, it's quite complex this one because it very much depends on the tumor type. So cancer cells or tumor cells, they reprogram, they change their metabolism and metabolism basically refers to all of the chemical reactions that take place inside a cell or the body more generally. But a cancer cell will reprogram those metabolic pathways such that it can grow faster or it can survive in certain conditions. It just basically wants to create a metabolic program that 
is advantageous. So for example, like ovarian cancers, ovarian cancer cells, they have been shown to scavenge or take up lipids, basically fats, from surrounding fat cells, what we call adipocytes, and that is beneficial in ovarian cancer. Something that is seen in a lot of cancers though, and the first kind of recognized metabolic change in cancer cells is what we call the Warbung effect. Cancer cells, they show a very high avidity for glucose, or they take up a lot of glucose. Glucose is fed into respiration, which results in the production of ATP, i.e. energy. All of our cells are undergoing respiration. But if you took a particular type of scan, it's what we call a PET scan, an FDG PET scan. This scan is based on looking at the glucose uptake in different organs in the body and you can spot a tumor mass because as I said, tumors take up a lot of glucose. As you can see on this diagram, there are certain organs in the body that naturally take up a lot of glucose, one being the brain. Our brains rely and need a lot of glucose, hence why on this diagram, this FDG PET scan again, they are very darkly staining. But this is used to identify tumors, essentially. It's a very useful tool, and it's basically the essence of the Warbung effect. However, the most important part of the Warbung effect is that normally cells in the body will undergo a type of respiration called aerobic respiration, in the presence of oxygen and if oxygen availability is limited then we will switch to undergoing anaerobic respiration and the product of anaerobic respiration is lactate. What a cancer cell does is regardless of the oxygen availability, tumor cells will constantly undergo anaerobic respiration so they constantly turn glucose into lactate and so that glucose isn't oxidized fully, it isn't fed into the aerobic respiratory pathway. It's just constantly and continuously made into lactate. So that combined with the high uptake of glucose kind of like summarizes the Warbung effect, but there are exceptions to that. There's lots of other metabolic reprogramming that goes on alongside, but that is basically the final hallmark of cancer, these changes in metabolism. So that is everything I basically had planned to talk to you guys about in this video. As always, if you have any questions, leave them down below. And if you have any video requests or ideas, then leave those down below as well so yeah i hope this video was interesting i hope you feel as if you know more about cancer as always give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it subscribe if you would like to stick around and hit the bell so you know when i upload and yeah as always i'll speak to you very soon in another video bye <laughs>